What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new episode of Crossed Up. Anthony Sanfilippo's here. I'm Bob Wankel. Anthony, uh, the Phillies with a win tonight against the Washington Nationals in the opener of a three-game series at Citizens Bank Park can win their 19th game of the month of June. Um, I'll ask it to you straight. Did you see this coming? We we talked a couple of weeks ago about can they get back to 500 by the end of the month and and they're they're pushing seven games over. Yeah, no. I, if I if you go back to that episode, I believe I said that I had them getting back to 500 by the end of the month. So they've certainly exceeded that expectation. Um, and maybe maybe that expectation was was tempered a little bit because you know. You know, earlier in the season, I was I was bullish on this team. Like, ah, oh, they'll figure it out. Ah, oh, they'll get it right. Everything will be fine. And then you watch them play and watch them play. And there are certain things that consistently remained frustrating and not good. And you sit there and go, okay, well, maybe they won't get to that ninety-one win plateau that I had them at at the beginning of the season. Um, and the, you know, and so when I would look at the month ahead. I said, eh, maybe gave him an extra couple losses here and there that I otherwise probably beginning of the season wouldn't have given them. Um, so, yes, yeah, so it's a, I'm not surprised that they righted the ship and got going in the right direction. But am I surprised that they're 19 and seven that quickly after being so terrible in the month of May? Yeah. I, and it's amazing to me because I, I don't know how this team does it. You always hear in sports, you can't just flip a switch. Right. And yet this team seems to be able to just flip a switch. When things are shitty, they, yeah, yeah, all right, flip that switch. We can go good. No worries. I'll, I'll never learn my lesson. Uh, we, we sat here and, and we talked in, in mid-May, all the first six, seven weeks of the season. We said, you know, it's great that they've been here before. They There's a precedent for this. That's fantastic. But it, it's hard to do. You can't just expect them to, to be able to run that that same exact path back. And they, they've done that more or less. And, one of the things that that's really amazing is the nine games in a row that they've won on the road. This team went from being one of the four worst teams in all of baseball on the road to basically playing 500, which is really all you need to do to be a playoff team, assuming that you take care of business at home. And right. so now they've run their record of 22 and 23 on the road. They played 45 road games already. And it's yeah. amazing because before we get to the all-star break, they're going to add another six to that when they go down to Florida and play in both Miami and Tampa Bay. So they're going to knock out a lot of these road games. They seem to have solved those issues, uh, at least for the time being. They've gotten themselves back into a spot where you feel good about them. They haven't, as we talked about earlier this week, they haven't really improved their, their positioning, although they are starting to knock on the door now. They've, they've gained a little bit of ground this week, one and a half games out of that final wild card spot. But it's a situation where now it's not just, okay, they're three games under and they're three games out. I guess they'll get in because everybody sucks. You're starting to feel good about where they're at. I mean, they win tonight. They're on an 88-game uh, or an 88-win pace halfway through the season, which I think you and I both – would have signed up for and it's essentially what we projected when we did these shows back in march we figured this was going to be about an 88 to 90 win team and and they're sort of now back on track after a disastrous start yeah i mean and, and that's you know like you said if you asked uh, asked me at the beginning of the season would i take them you know at the halfway point 44 wins i said yeah sure i'll take that i mean it, it was probably you know a couple wins below the pace that i would have expected them to be on but hey things happen I'll take 44. That's that's a playoff team, man. You know, that's an 88 win team. That's certainly going to get it. That's going to get in the playoffs this year. So, yeah, if you said to me at, at after 81 games, the end of June, they're going to they're going to be uh, 44 and 37. I'm I'm some I'm signed up for that. I'm good with that. So, yeah, I mean, it's it, they're they're a they're a, um, a a real team that, you know, after the fact will be fun to go back and study because I think that they. I think that they break convention in a lot of ways. Like you think that this team should lose games and then they win them. And then you think that this team should win certain games and they find ways to lose them. And you just say, well, why? And, you know, and then you have a 185 leadoff hitter. Well, yeah, but it works. You know, you have a, a cleanup hitter who hasn't hit a home run in over a month. Yeah, but it works. Like I, like I don't understand it. And I don't think any other team in baseball has all of these things that don't normally make sense but the Phillies do and it makes sense to them and it works for them so 
if they had gotten swept by the Cubs, we could have come on this show and said, here's why it doesn't work for them. Yeah. They have a third baseman in Alec Boom that can't hit the ball over the fence. They have a first baseman that shows no power whatsoever, whether it's Alec Boom playing or Cody Clemens. They have uh, a former MVP in Bryce Harper that hasn't hit a home run in a month. The catcher struggling outside of uh, basically a, an electric 10-game stretch earlier this month. Uh, they don't have a fifth starter. You know, they've had bullpen injuries. There's a lot of different things that you could point to as why you, you don't believe in this team or why you don't like them. But one of the things I think that kind of has been overlooked here is that when they get to the all-star break, and there's a long way to go, there's still nine more games here. And these nine games can really dictate the feel of, of those, those three or four off days that you get when the all-star game rolls around. Uh, which, by the way, the Phillies have like they're going to have like one All Star. <laughs> like this team, this team could be ten games over, and they're going to have one, maybe two All Stars going into the game. Two, yeah. I think they're going to have two. Yeah, yeah. But they're going to get to the All Star break having played fifty one games on the road and thirty eight games at home. Well, August is nuts. Did you see that? I yeah, can't wait, I can't wait to start talking about our schedule in August. So, Holy hell, uh, and that's going to matter moment. when you start to talk about the amount of teams, the number of teams that are in this race, the schedules. And the Phillies have a significant advantage in that way, especially when you get to the month of August. And you you kind of do think as you look at it, and you just never know. You really never know. We've done the schedule game a couple times this season. We've been wrong. But it, it really does set up in a very favorable fashion. I, I have to, to ask you this. Of all the things that have happened, 18, 19 wins this month, what is the one thing that surprises you the most about what has happened over the last 30 days? Is it a, a certain trend, a certain player? It, what is it that just jumps off the page where you go, man, I'm, I'm stunned that, that that's what we're seeing right now? Because I have two answers, one good, one bad. Uh, well, I, I think the thing that continues to stun me, and it's a thing that I, I don't think that they can get where they want to go unless they rectify it, is – just their approach when they get a runner in scoring position. Like it just, it, it I, I don't understand it. Like this was a clutch team last year. This was a team that when, when the chips were down, they did, they came through, they would get the big hit, right? They would drive in that run and, and, you know, put pressure on a team. And this year they just are, they're up there flailing. They get behind. It's like every count is Oh, two, one, two whenever there's a runner on second or a runner on third. And I don't understand it. It's a completely different at bat when there's a runner in scoring position than when there's not. And it's every player. It's chronic. It's not like, oh, just this one or two guys. It's every frigging play. They were 0 for 3 with runners in scoring position in the first inning yesterday. Yeah, they were 1 for 9 for the game. <laughs> 1 for 9. Yeah. They've I mean, had this annoying habit here where – they, they kind of get at you early, and then they just sort of turn off the Jets. It's like, all right, well, that's that's enough. That's That'll that'll take care of it. I mean, that game last night, that could have been a loss, right? Like, yeah. how many times have you seen that happen? You get the, the quick run with Schwarber, you strand Turner, then all of a sudden, instead of being up 2-0, you're down 3-2. I mean, the, the pitching has really – Yeah, well – I mean, the pitching great. has just saved them because we would be – the wins are hiding the things that we would otherwise be talking about. Some of the things that we talked about after that Atlanta series, and they are real problems and they need to be rectified. And you look at this team's record and it's, it's amazing. If they were league average with runners in scoring position, I'm not going to say that I know with absolute certainty that you could sign uh, assign a specific number to it, but if they were league average with runners in scoring position this season, there's no doubt in my mind, they probably have another three, four wins right now. Oh yeah. A thousand I mean, percent easily thousand percent yes 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 um you know look in the grand scheme we're gonna go you know as this season progresses we're gonna we're gonna watch this team play and they're gonna win a bunch more games and they're gonna probably leapfrog into the wild card into a wild card spot in my mind i think they'll leapfrog into a wild card spot by the all-star break if you know if not sooner um and we're going to be watching them play in this wild card race down the stretch. And we're going to harken back to geez, how bad was may? Mm -hmm. 
Like if they could have just done one, like won a couple games, they're different, you know, have a couple games go differently. And if they could have just, you know, knocked in a few more runs at those and in, in those times when they were really scuffling, well, this wouldn't even be a race. But now it's a race because because of that, because they put themselves in that hole. But that being said, I do think that they thrive off of off of that. Right. They thrive off of the pressure of being in that spot. I don't know. It's it's again, like I said, Bob, it's a, it's a team that that leaves me befuddled at times. And I don't understand it. All the years I've watched baseball, as much baseball as I watched, I, I've not seen anything like this. And yet and yet here they are right in the middle of it yet again. I don't know how you were as a student. And I know that you uh, teach a course uh, in the summertime, right? Uh, yep. Or have previously. I don't know if you are again this, yep. this year. Yeah. Um, you know, there's students that always find a way to get it done. Uh, they, they end up with an A in the course, but they've been given a paper. They have three weeks to do it and they're up the night before it's three 30 in the morning. They got yeah. the Red Bull going, they got the third cup of coffee uh -huh. and then they just say, all right, it's time to do it. And then they do it. I mean, that's almost like what this team is. It's like, yeah. you could have made this easier on yourselves. You could have not been seven games under, uh, at the end of May, you could have just been, Set your just do a little bit of the work ahead of time. Just make it easy on yourself. That night before the paper's done, maybe you turn on the computer, you do a couple quick edits, you hit send. It's all good. Instead, this team waits to do the research, waits to write the damn thing. Probably waits to the, the last night to actually go out and even buy the computer. I mean, that's that's like what this team is like, and it's what it's been like for two years. When they have to do it, I give them credit. They find a way to do it, but their their path there is very unconventional and. You know, you start to look at this and we talk about how they haven't made up ground. And I'm fixated on that right now. I know we talked a little bit about it on it's Wednesday. Stunning. It's stunning. You just It's amazing to have this type of month. And this is where you usually see the before and after of the, the standings. You say, wow, here you go. On June 1st, look, they're seven games out. Oh, wait, on June 30th, they, they go 19 and seven in a month. And now they're, they're in first place or they're a game out or you see this big shift in the standings and we're not seeing that. No. But it's interesting. As, as good as they've been, and I can't ask them to sweep the Nationals at home. They, they've been so good. You can't just assume sweeps. But you get into a situation this weekend where you should win the series. And to be honest with you, barring a an emotional letdown. And I know we don't really talk about baseball this way. Like you're going to be favored pretty heavily. I'll put it to you that way. You're going to be favored pretty heavily in each of these games individually. So if there's a, a scenario in which you do sweep this nationals team nationals, by the way, not a bad week out there in uh, Seattle. Was it right? Seattle. Is that where yeah. they were? Yeah. Playing some competitive baseball. Uh, but this is a weekend where the Phillies could probably make a little bit of a move there are some interesting matchups and and i know that we're not even at july 4th we're not at the all-star break you you don't need to go scoreboard watching here in great detail but you finally you get you get the miami atlanta series there's gonna have to be a little beat up on one another there uh you got the mets like, I, I mean like, to me like the mets you're almost in a position where you're rooting i i, I it's I, I say this lightly, but I'm almost like looking at the Mets and going, is it time to almost root for them to not have the wheels totally fall off and maybe start winning a couple games? And I say that because they, they play the Giants tonight, and that's the team that the Phillies are directly behind. And there, there is something about this mentally for me where I'm like, get into one of those wild card spots, and then I'll feel a lot better about where they're at. Yeah, no, of course. You don't like chasing, right? You like you want to be the hunted and not the hunter um, for sure. Um, yeah, I mean, look, the, the Nationals, this, is, this series is not going to be as, as easy as maybe people think. Um, you know, Nationals are coming off of a very good road trip where they went four and two against the Padres and the Mariners. Um, and they're throwing three, you know, okay pitchers at the Phillies. And so you gotta, you gotta, you, you gotta suck it up and, 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 and be, you know, be at your best. You can't, you know, take the foot off the gas just because you're playing a, a team you should beat. You tonight feels like the one, right? Like, yeah, well, tonight tonight's the one. one. I mean, Sanchez has been good. There's not, nothing against him, but you just think sweep the Cubs, come back home, a little bit flat maybe. You're playing yeah. the Nationals. You're not really up for that. We'll see. We'll yeah. see. I mean, I, I, you know, have they had great success against Josiah Gray in the past? I, I, I don't 
I didn't. I wanted to look that up, and I didn't do so. Uh, some, but something tells me, and just in my head, that he's actually pitched decently against the Phillies in his career. Um, you just so I, I can't get over it. Though. I'm scrolling through, looking at the odds tonight. Phillies minus one eighty though, with Christopher Sanchez on the mound against Josiah Gray. Minus one eighty. They are uh, other than the Braves. Other than the Braves and then the Dodgers who are playing the Royals, they're the biggest favorites on the board tonight. So, I mean, like, Gray's been good this year. Sanchez has been fine in these two appearances that we've seen. Um, I just think it could be a potential, a little bit of a, a little bit of a letdown. But then you come back with Wheeler tomorrow, uh, late afternoon game, and then you have San- – um, I'm sorry, you have uh, Suarez in the finale. And, and, like, so you just feel good about where they're at. And, like, I wouldn't go through this game by game, but – I'm telling you, like, I think everyone feels this. I, I do. Yeah. I think you can recognize, wow, what a month. There's so much I feel good about, but, but damn, like they're still on the outside looking in right now at an 88 win pace. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's weird. It's just, it's just, it's very, it's a weird season. Um, and I, I did just look up the numbers. So actually Josiah Gray's ERA is not great against the Phillies. It's 5.64 and six starts. Um, but here's the thing. He's thrown 30 innings and the Phillies have hit 10 home runs against him. Mm-hmm. Well, they're not hitting home runs this year, although they yeah. did start to hit a few in Chicago, right? But maybe so maybe it is starting to turn a little bit. But he's only given up 27 hits against the Phillies, right? So you so 10 of the 27 hits were home runs, and so that's why his ERA is as, as high as it is. He has walked a few guys too. Um, he's also a different pitcher this season, too. I mean, yeah. you know, ERA is down by a run and a half, so yeah. so it's right. So I'm saying like this, this one, this is the one that sticks out to me, and uh, as like. This could be the an issue, but I'll also say, and even though they did just beat up on Drew Smiley, who's left-handed, but Drew Smiley stinks, um, going against Mackenzie Gore tomorrow, Gore's an okay pitcher, and he's left-handed, yeah. and the Phillies have struggled against lefties. So, like, I, you know, they, it's going to be tough to sweep this team. I'll be honest. The, the Nats are playing well. They, they're throwing some decent pitchers, a couple of matchups that aren't the greatest for the Phillies. Um, so, yes, yeah, so you got to be you got to be on your game. You can't have you know, blunders like they had yesterday that they got that Taiwan Walker pitched out of, which were two. Well, we know the deal with the Nationals, too. They put the ball in play, not right. a lot of strikeouts. They're not a dynamic lineup by any stretch of the imagination, but they can give you some competitive at-bats and a dink and a dunk and a, a ball in the gap, and all of a sudden you say, okay, we're, we're in a game here, you know? So I, I don't know. I, I don't want to spend too much time previewing the National Series, so to speak, but – Here's here's the thing that surprises me. The well, most. I don't want to look and, past them. No, I don't either. I'm I not, I'm not writing them, them off. I'm, yeah, not saying say. that they, I'm not saying, hey, this isn't a series a series win. Book it. I'm not saying that. I'm just, you know, like yeah. let, let's be real. Like I mean, they should they should take care of this team. They should they should win the series at home. They're playing as well as they have with the the momentum that they have and, and a little bit of a chase spot still. You know, I, I think it's reasonable to expect as a heavy favorite in all three games that you come out and and win you know they're like, they're like minus 210 to win this series that's pretty high and, in yeah and you know and, and and my expectation does remain them to win remain for them to win the series and you know but I, but it, it, to me it's not as it's not as cut and dry that they will let's just let me just right. there's just part of me that just goes yeah they're, they're probably going to win the series but i don't think it's going to be as easy as people think it's going to be yeah, no, I'm I'm with you on that. If that of, makes of, any all sense. The things, of all the things that surprised me, we can talk about the the resurgence of this rotation, uh, the struggles that they had for two months, what they've done in the month of June, and and we've sort of we've sort of referenced this along the way. I mean, the rotation's twelve and three and twenty five um, total starts here this month. The numbers we we kind of know the numbers by now but i mean they've they've been excellent a 272 staff era and that's kind of with a, a stumble from Zach Wheeler last sunday Aaron Noel was not great this week in chicago and it's it's funny like the tone of this show we're going to not talk about a lot of things that we would have otherwise talked about like we could come back to we could come back to runners in scoring position we could come back to another Aaron Nola conversation we could talk about are they a guy short in the bullpen? Like there are things that we could talk about, but it's it's hard to kind of point out those flaws and point out those negatives. The thing though that I I am just stunned by is is what we've seen from from Taiwan Walker, and 
we were talking about this guy after about a month and a half. And I think we were smart enough to know, and you can go back and roll the tape. We say like, Hey, you can't write him off. You can't say this is a bust. You can't say that it's not going to work out or that they wish they could redo the contract. Like, we didn't say those things, but what we did say was, wow, there are some, some real concerns here. And there were some blow up starts. There was velocity issues. There were, what looked like almost phantom injuries where like, yo, he's going to go on the IL right after this start and he would make his next start. And now you fast forward and you look at what he's done in the month of June. And I would argue that if it weren't for Ranger Suarez, I mean, you could make it a pretty strong case that the Taiwan Walker was the national league pitcher of the month. Yeah. Well, I'm going to, I'm the interesting thing here is Bob as great as, and, and the, Phillies pitching top to bottom has been just lights out this month. Obviously, they lead the they lead the majors in almost every pitching category, right? Or they're near the top in almost every pitching category. But for the month of June, their their one and their two have not been their one and their two. Their one and two this month have been Suarez and Walker. Right. I mean, let's let's be honest about it. And, and sure. that's not knocking, you know, Wheeler's had some good some good starts. Noel's had a couple good starts in there. It, it doesn't matter. Wheeler, Suarez and Wheeler. I mean, Suarez and Walker have been just consistent and superb with every start this month. Taiwan Walker in the month of June, five and one, a one five oh ERA, 36 innings pitched. And that actually counts a, a four-inning start at, at the beginning of the month with the, against the Mets that was was not particularly inspiring. I mean, his last five times out, he's been he's been unbelievable. And you say, okay, you know, you look at the ERA and say that's wonderful, but was he lucky? Did he was, did he kind of benefit from being able to work out of jams? We saw that last night. Jams that weren't really even his fault. His defense put him in those jams, but. No, I mean, you you kind of go a little bit deeper. I mean, opponents hit 171 against him this month. His whip was 0 0.89 in June. I mean, like I said, you could make a real case that when you tally up the, the pitchers of the month in the National League for the month of June, he's probably one of the top four guys. I mean, he's he's been that good. And I feel like his production, the, the, you, you said it, Suarez Walker being your best two guys this month, I don't think is a bad thing. I think that that kind of speaks volumes because it's not like Nola and Wheeler were horrible. Right. I think that is, is now become a strength for you that you can get four deep into this rotation and say, I like our chances tonight. Like I, I now I'm in a point where, and even with Sanchez and we'll see how it goes tonight, but you're almost at a point when you sit down to watch a Phillies game and you look at the, the probable pitcher, you don't go, Oh shit you know, scheduled loss or, oh, they're really going to have to hit tonight. Like you reason, you, you expect to get a quality start out of whoever's taking the ball right now. They're in that type of rhythm. And it, it's reasonable, I think, to expect it to, to continue here. Now, here's one for you. Tylen Walker's nine and three right now. Yeah. I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you two other names and I'm going to ask you why I'm giving you those names. Okay. <laughs> Steve Carlton. Roy Halladay, Taiwan Walker. What would the thread here be? Uh, uh, come on, you're Mr. Uh, immaculate, immaculate grid. I thought you'd be all over this one. By the way, immaculate grid uh, has the Phillies involved today. Three of the nine. Oh, good. Answers, I, right? Maybe I'll get. Maybe I'll get so up to eight today. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I, I'm, I'm trying to pick to put this together, I guess. Uh, pitchers who could have 10 wins before the all star break. Well, uh, I was you're on the right track. How about <laughs> Phillies pitchers to how about Phillies pitchers dating back to the mid 70s that have won 20 games? Oh, okay, uh, we, we're, right. in a, we're like in yeah. a world here where like he's not quite there, but he's he's pacing, knocking at the door of a 20-win pace right now. And I know that we don't care yeah. about pitcher wins in 2023. I, I know that that's not a thing anymore. But, like, that's unbelievable to me, especially considering that this is the same guy that was out in San Francisco about six weeks ago, couldn't get out of the first inning, and you're like, oh, my God, like, this is this is a nightmare. And, and now you're talking about a guy that's on pace to win 18 games for this team. Yeah, look, I mean, Taiwan Walker has 
he figured something out. And he keeps saying it's all about, you know, staying athletic between starts. What does that mean? Does that mean that like, he was he was getting lazy? Does that have mean you, that he have you heard that, that he takes ground balls between starts? And that's what I'm saying. Like, what does that mean? Like, I I, I can't I'm not just gonna sit there and say, oh, this guy suddenly is is good again because he's taking you know ground balls during BP. Like that's right. not it. I, and he's you know, that he's out there working with the team and taking you know fielding. He's over there catching balls at first base from the infielders. Like they, like that's not why you're pitching well. So when he talks about being more athletic, does that mean that he was out of shape and got yeah. himself into shape? I believe like, it was said on the broadcast last night. I, I think. I think Tom McCarthy said something along the lines of, you know, he's always been in good shape, but he's gotten himself into even better shape. And so if you kind of read between the lines yes. there, there's like an insinuation that yeah, maybe Taiwan wasn't in the best of best of physical condition coming, coming into this season and maybe through the first five weeks of it. I mean, you said it, we had the conversation, go back to that Mets start. That was a day game, right? If I'm yeah. not mistaken. And didn't he, after that start, say something along the lines of like body clock like it was early yeah. i wasn't i wasn't quite where i needed to be this time of day and i yep. remember you and i kind of going like what are what are you talking about man yeah and i think maybe there was something after that where he said okay like i'm not i'm not in the best spot possible to make these starts as effective as they can be i need to change something so i mean maybe there is something to that and that's just a polite way to kind of spin it yeah no, absolutely. Um, and, and here's another thing with with Walker. And I know wins is not really a thing anymore in, in baseball, right? I mean, should it be? A, should it be? Shouldn't it wins well, be a thing? I, I, you know me. Like I'm pretty numbers oriented. Like I'm a little bit more. So I, I said for it. I, I think that I think there is something to be said for it. Be, I mean, there's something. There should be something to be said for it because pitchers get pulled so early in games now, right? So a lot of times games are decided by bullpens. Yeah. So that if you're a starting pitcher and you're accumulating a lot of wins, that means you're going deeper in games and you're you're you know you're keeping your team in it or you're you know you're keeping your other team off the scoreboard. So you're doing something right. Yeah. Right now the only guys in the National League with more wins than Taiwan Walker are Zach Gallon and Clayton Kershaw. And they each have 10. <laughs> I mean, so, so I mean, think about that for a second. Wins, maybe they don't count as much, but the two guys that are ahead of him are two guys who are, you know, amongst the early contenders for Cy Young, right, uh, in this league, and he's right behind them. He's third. So, like, there's, you know, there's something to that, and I, you know, I, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna just dismiss it because it's a stat that's not as important in the sport anymore. What about RBI? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, the I Phillies, have a Philly show here, and I'm like, well, what do you think about runs batted in? The, the Phillies' leader in, in runs batted in is should be an all star, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, if we're really going to be honest about it, because Castellanos is just having talking about a guy who just keeps on keeps on keeping on, man, and he was great in that Cub series yesterday's game aside, but uh, the first two games of that series, he was awesome. You know, the big three run homer and an RBI double and. Just keeps on hitting amongst the league's leader, league leaders in hits and amongst the league leaders in batting average. Uh, I think he's now got what twenty four doubles or something along those lines. I mean, it's guys having a year. There are a few other things that I want to say that are uh, along the positive on the positive side of the ledger. Uh, and then I have something that we need to talk about. We we have uh -huh. to address this. We haven't talked about it on this show now for a while, uh, and it's time that we we be honest. So. Uh, real quick here, uh, this bullpen, a name that we, we just rarely talk about is Craig Kimbrell. And we've gotten to a point now where he comes into a game and you're not like, well, you know, OK, I feel I feel all right about this. He's really in a groove to this point where you're saying, man, if you just take away one or two blow ups earlier this season, you could make a case for him being a legitimate national league all-star not just a legacy guy hey let's invite him in 400 saves all that stuff i mean yeah. he's been awesome for this team the last five six weeks he's been really really good um it's been almost automatic you start to look at him the, the combination with him and soto especially there there's just so much to like on this pit from the from a pitching perspective right now and, and kimbrell is a guy i think we just kind of keep glossing over yeah, but the thing of it is, is that, you know, beginning of the year, 
they the Phillies, you know, Rob Thompson would not commit to any one guy being his closer. He was going to always he was going to do the matchup game, right? And and find the guy that uh you know, best fits in that role at in that specific game. Um and Kimbrell has basically just said, "Oh yeah, watch." And he's yeah. taken it. And he's basically taking it. And so if you really want to look at it, Bob, since that uh, allowing that walk off grand slam to Max Muncy in early May in, in, L- in L.A., he's had uh, he's appeared in 21 games. He's been the last pitcher out there 17 of those 21 times. OK, so 21 innings, 1.29 ERA. Yeah. OK, the batting average against is 125. He's given up nine hits in almost two months. Yeah. 36 strikeouts to five walks. It's really, really frigging good. Yep. <laughs> right? I mean, it, it's sensational. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that, look, look, the whole back end of the bullpen is is what makes this team, to me, dangerous. Once you get into – if you talk about getting into the playoffs, once you're there – like this is if these guys are healthy at the end of the year, that's what makes the Phillies dangerous because your pitch, your starting pitchers, if they're great, it's a bonus. But even if they're just okay, you have four guys right now that you could just run out there and be like, "Yep, you ain't touching them." What do you make of Jose Alvarado since he's been back? So he's thrown, I believe, now nine innings, eight nine yeah. innings. He's his ERA is sitting at three since he's returned. So it's not like, oh my goodness, he's giving up a ton of runs, but he is giving up a ton of base runners. I mean, he's given yeah. up 17 base runners in nine innings since he's returned off the IL. Is that reason for concern? I mean, we still see the velocity hundred. He's had some important appearances where he's gotten key outs. He, you know, the other night in Chicago, things got weird for a moment. He slammed the door after that. I'm not in a, a state of panic about what I'm seeing, but he is not the same pitcher that he was prior to the injury no he's not it's almost like he had to kind of restart the season all over again after coming back and I think that the Phillies are being a little have they've been a little kid gloves with him um maybe not so much in the, in the last week um I mean he had does have four appearances and in, in, he did have four appearances in six days or seven days whatever it was um so yeah I mean yeah they, they maybe just started taking the you know, taking the training wheels off, uh, but they were very careful with him for a little bit. Um, yeah, I, I think that he's walking guys a little bit more than he was. I mean, he didn't have a walk before he got hurt, and yeah. he's got seven since in, what is that, the last nine appearances, right, since he came back? Is that what you said, nine yeah. appearances? So seven walks and nine appearances. Still got 37 strike guess 37 strikeouts to seven walks i mean it's a pretty good ratio right but the seven walks i think is the, is the thing um and yeah he's given up some hits i mean he's only had he had uh i don't think he's had a clean inning since he came back right i think he's had either a walk or a hit in in every appearance since he's come back so yeah i mean it's a little bit it's a little bit off but i do think it's something that if you take a month off and you got to find it again I think he will. I think he'll get there. He's still he's still not getting blown up like he was a year ago before they sent him down. Um, so I think that the, it's one of those situations where this isn't as good as he was earlier, but it's also not panic mode either. He's just going through a little bit, and we'll we'll get that fixed out. And I think that they, I think he will, and I think they will. One other thing I want to just touch on since we're in the bullpen right now. You know, you look at uh, Junior Marte, and it's like feast or famine with him. And we see the arm, and you know how much Rob Thompson has talked about him this season. And he likes the natural sink, and he's throwing 98, 99 miles an hour. We see him close a game against the A's. He was unbelievable last night in the seventh inning against the Cubs. But in between, there's been some stumbles. And it's like he's on the brink of being a guy that you can sort of trust late in games to, to get an out, but then there's the Atlanta appearance and then there's the Arizona appearance and there, there's a level of inconsistency there. 
how do you view him at this point? And one thing I want to note specifically last night, his slider was, was really sharp and he threw it harder. Like I was watching it and I'm like, this doesn't look like the same, the same slider that I've seen from him lately. So then you go into baseball savant, you pull up the stack cast numbers and you see that his slider last night maxed out at 90. He had a mile and a half extra on average on that slider last night. And you, you wonder like the Phillies say, see something there and say, Hey, but that things have been flattening out a little bit. Like, let's throw it harder. Let's make that adjustment. And then you see that, okay, wait, now there, is this another weapon developing? I don't really know how to look at him because I've been impressed with him at times and I'm expecting a little bit more. And then that blow up comes and you go, damn, you can't trust this guy. So how do you sort of see him? And is, is he, is he a guy that remains on this roster here moving yes. forward? Or, okay. Yes. Because his here's, here's, Again, let's look at it since he, since the the recall, right? Um, well, I think he technically had two recalls, but he went down and came right back up. So we're going to not count that. But since, since you know he got sent down after getting blown up in L.A. May second, and then came back May twentieth. The only two games that he's had a quote unquote blow up were against the Diamondbacks and the Braves, and the Braves one is the result resulted from Kyle Schwarber not being able to catch a freaking fly ball right five unearned runs um so other than that he's not giving up anything i think he's gonna have one run besides those two games since may 20th that's pretty good all right it's pretty good and yeah yeah is he you know does he get himself into a little bit of trouble he's only had a couple of straight clean innings right i mean um you know the one against chicago i guess on on saturday was a clean inning um he had one uh against oakland but that's against oakland right where he had three strikeouts um uh and i i think he had one um yeah it goes back to when they played arizona at home back in may he had a couple uh clean innings there but so so yeah he's he, like alvarado he's another guy gives up a base runner gives up two base runners and you go yeah and i think that that's why we get a little bit more worried about him but with each appearance his era keeps coming down Keeps coming down, keeps coming down. And when he came back from uh, the minor leagues on May 20th, his ERA was 18. That's how bad he was beforehand, right? It's now down to 5.95, which still isn't good, but it's working its way down. It's working its way down. And I, so I do think that there's, I think that there's something there. I, I, I believe in him and I, I just think it's a steadier kind of process with him. It's not like Kimbrel, he's coming out and blowing you away and just dominating. But I think he's getting there. So I, I do. I do buy into it. And I think you might have been onto something with the slider. Throw it harder. It might have more bite and, and get people guessing where you'll get more swing and miss. I think that's a thing with him. Um, it might be worth asking that question this weekend when we go down there uh, to, to talk about uh, talk about things. When you're looking for something to ask the manager pregame, that might be one of them. It, it, good problem to have here, having some bullpen depth, both at the major league and minor league level. And these things have a way of sort of straightening themselves out. Just when you think you might have too many arms, a guy goes on the IL, things happen. Sir Anthony Dominguez, it, it looks like the indications are that he will probably be back not too long uh, after he's eligible to return, which then kind of creates another, I don't want to say a log jam, but they're going to have to make a corresponding move in that bullpen. So it, how do you how do you look at that? Do you is there an obvious candidate? Do you think it's a is it is it potentially Hoffman? Like how do they play that when he comes back? And then the, the only other reason I bring this up, you have Connor Brogdon still rattling around in Lehigh Valley, but the the one guy that's kind of getting hard to overlook. And like, keep in mind, Andrew Bellotti, he yeah. threw important outs for this team last season, and he did it in the postseason. And I know we, we talked about the Phillies essentially killing him uh, the first month of the season. And, and he had struggled at the major league level. But you start to look at what he has done this month with the Iron Pigs. And, you know, in the month of June, he's thrown nine innings. He's allowed just seven hits, one walk, 11 strikeouts. I mean, he has not given up a run in the month of June at AAA. So at what point do we start to look at him again and say, like, this is a guy that we know can do it at this level. How much longer can you keep him? You keep him down. You know, it's it's a great question. Like, I, I there are going to be some some real tough decisions coming in this bullpen. Um, I think the first one's an easy one. I think is whoever comes back first, whether it's whether it's you know Dominguez comes, of, comes off yeah. the IL or you want to bring up Bellotti, 
uh, or Brogdon even for that matter, but I think Bilotti's probably first coming back. It's Dylan Covey, right? I mean, that's that's the automatic in my well, mind. Well, does this and, and you you got me because you're one step ahead. I was going to say to you tonight with Sanchez going again. This will be the third time that we've seen him since he came back up. Is this almost like the start that that kills Dylan Covey? Like if if Sanchez can go out and give you five functional innings tonight, th- this rotation at the, this point is completely stabilized. You don't need him as a fifth starter. You don't really even need him as a mop-up guy. Like they have other guys in that bullpen that can throw that that fourth, fifth, and sixth inning or bridge that if you have a blow-up start. Like every team has that. You don't have to employ Dylan Covey at this point if you know that you have you're going to get reasonable length out of, of your starting rotation. Like so, if if Sanchez blows up though tonight, does that give the Phillies a, a reason to say, well, you know, maybe maybe we got to hold on to him? Because yeah, I mean, he's certainly the most obvious move when you go to bring back a Dominguez or if you call up a Bellotti. But dude, like, I can't believe he's still here now. So yeah, so here's 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 what I think that they could do, Bob. I, I'm just just spitballing here i don't know this for certain but if you look at having the off day monday it can help it can help them so you got sanchez going tonight even if he pitches well let's just say whatever and then you know it's what wheeler tomorrow and suarez on sunday then you have an off day then you have three games in tampa do you really want to start christopher sanchez in tampa no. You probably can. You probably can push that number five spot to the Miami series, right? Uh, where it's a weaker lineup. Um, and you Although can, you, I could make the argument that Miami head to head right now creates more, a little bit more a, urgency. It's a more important game. I agree. It's a more important game. But if you're looking at if you want to go with the matchup, you probably yeah. would rather Sanchez pitch against the Marlins than you than you would against Tampa. But then, but here's where I'm going with this. So you could technically push push back the number five start because of the off day to the to July eighth, which is the second Saturday, right? Uh, the, the next to the last game before the All Star break. Right. Let's say two of these guys you want to bring up Bellotti, and let's say Dominguez is able to come is ready to come back, and Covey's the the easy guy out. Can you do you bump Sanchez and go with a bullpen game? Yeah, maybe, start yeah. you start Matt Strom for two innings and then you know piecemeal it from there. I kind of don't want to do one, that. Like I kind of don't want. I know you. I know you don't. I know you don't. But it's it, you're right before the All Star break where you can reset everything, right? So that's so I'm just trying to say you could get three of your better pitchers against the Rays, and yes, you're using a bullpen game, but it's the next to last game before the All Star break, and then you're going to give guys four days off. Yeah. So so it's almost like you can kind of. You know, push it a little, push them a little bit because you know they're going to have all that time off. I, I think that that's a possibility. Plus, if you're bringing guys back like a Bellotti from from the minors, maybe you you know you, you're getting a fresh arm kind of thing in a yeah. lot of ways. You know, I think that the Phillies have that option. So I don't, I'm not certain that even if Christopher Sanchez pitches well tonight, that he makes the next start for the Phillies. Only pushback I would have on that is that the fifth starter spot has been such an issue and there has been so much instability that it, let's say he does pitch well tonight and you say, okay, that's three straight times now that he's gone out and done a really, uh, he's done good work for us. He builds on the Oakland start, gives you five innings competitively against the Mets, comes in then tonight and gives you five or six. If that, if that happens, right. You almost just say, we don't need to push our pitchers, and also we've got this thing figured out. Let's just let it play out naturally. I mean, but but the, but here's here's my here's the one pushback I'll give to that answer. Is it better to have just because he's been pitching okay to keep Christopher Sanchez for that fifth starter spot when it comes up, or does bringing Bellotti and and Dominguez back into your bullpen? mean more for all the games in between right. and, and, and uh, around valid it. Valid point. Uh, valid point. I'd be curious to see what they do. And yeah. obviously Sanchez pitching well and continuing to pitch well has got to happen first before we really Correct. even evaluate that. Because he goes out and he blows up tonight. You go, okay, there's really, yeah. there's truly no need to do this. Um, the, the other thing I just, uh, we kind of sometimes don't talk about like the fringe roster pieces and there, there's a couple other interesting things developing here in Lehigh Valley. And 
And, and one of them, I actually don't think you would expect, but just by the way, Scott Kingery hitting 272 OPS is pushing 800. I know triple a pitching sucks, but yeah. if five runs batted in last night. Like just wondering like down the line, if like Josh Harrison, Scott Kingery, which one would you rather have? Like, is there some world where we might get to like mid August and, and that becomes a thing he's got to continue to hit, but like he's, he's been all right down there. But that's, that's kind of an aside. The, the thing I really want to look at is, you know, Jake Cave, you know, he's just still hitting. He had a multiple hit game last night. OPS is over 1.1. 1. 1. Uh, you know, and then you look at you look at Hall. Like, you look at Derek Hall. Like, I, there are – like, the Phillies could use Derek Hall's power, if, if nothing else. Is he still blocked? Because a month ago we, like, we said, hey, they love Cody Clemens. He's playing good defensive first base they really just don't have a spot to do this right now. Like they've got to make decisions here and it's been written about like Alex coffee and the inquirer had something about hall and you know, he he's likely to return here at some point, but like, how do you, how do you massage this? How do you work out the numbers? Yeah, it's, it's weird. It's a tough spot to be in because they don't want to get too left-handed, but at the same time, if you're left, if your best guys that are down there are left-handed, why are you not using them instead of, the, the the guys you have up there look Cody Clemens went through a has gone through a rough patch although he does have a does have a couple hits lately he's played some okay defense at first base like he's not killed you there mm-hmm. he does offer versatility too like he can play multiple positions um which Derek Hall cannot and so I think that that's the question that you need to ask yourself is it more important to try and get some thump into the lineup even though it's going to hurt us defensively and with flexibility or does the you know does Clemens flexibility mean more to us than potentially adding whatever power Derek Hall would give us at this level um as for as for Jay Cave I I don't know how you keep how how do you not bring him back I just how do you not I, I don't know if you really need two guys who can play all over the infield on your bench even if they're both right-handed, like to me, I'd rather, I'd rather just keep one of them, whether you want to keep Sosa or Harrison, it's probably Sosa because he's better defensively. Right. Um, I, I'd rather keep Sosa and then go with Jake cave as a bench bat bat off the bench. He doesn't even have to start, like just be the left-handed pinch hitter, which they don't. So really... If you can pull up hall or cave right now, what, what would you do? Cave. I mean, that's, it's amazing because you're talking about a guy, and, and I think that, that fans got a little bit carried away with Derek Hall last year, and yeah. certainly he gave them important power at a time they needed it. Bryce Harper went out. He he was big for this team. But here's a guy that is presumably going to be your first baseman once Reese Hoskins goes down. He gets hurt. He comes back. He's hitting 326 with a 941 OPS with the Iron Pigs right now. Like yeah. he's done everything that he's supposed to do and he's blocked. And and listen, that's good. You know, in a way like that's great. It's good that the Phillies are in a position where they have enough depth or they have enough quality players that a, it's it's not a slam dunk that Derek Hall just comes back and plays because he does have a lack of versatility. Like those are real concerns. He can't hit lefties. We we know the deal there. But Man, so, like you almost feel for the guy on a human level. Yeah, so here's the thing, Bob. This is how I look at it. <clears throat> We're fast approaching Bryce Harper playing first base. It's going to happen probably right after the All-Star break. I mean, that's that's my expectation. I think we'll see it that first series after the All-Star break against San Diego. So we're only talking about two more weeks, right? At that point, you if he can – if let's assume he can – adequately play that position even if it's not great but just being adequate at first base that gives you the flexibility you need to have jake cave on this roster because then jake cave can play more in left field and you dh schwarber right and then you can give that a shot for a couple of weeks and see does jake cave continue to hit you know anywhere close to what he was doing in the minor obviously he's not going to have those kind of numbers at the major league level but can he at least give you something at the major league level with some regular at bats right. and if he can then it makes the deadline and an, a little bit more interesting right and then you start looking at what you can do at the deadline um 
but I'd rather have, if nothing else, I'd rather have Jake Cave's bat coming off the bench as a left-handed option that can that can drive the ball than I would have what they currently have on the bench. I just don't, I don't like it. I don't like the bench a little bit. I think that, you know, and I know there's not a lot of pinch hitting in baseball because you have, because of the DH, but there's going to be spots in games where they're going to bring, uh, the opponent's going to bring in a, a relief pitcher that just, you don't like that matchup with the guy that's in the game. And, if you want to have an option off the bench that you can go to, so have it. Yeah. Don't not have it. Don't don't settle for. Oh uh, well, well we'll we'll take this matchup. It's not the greatest, but we'll take it. Don't settle. Have have an option to make them think about because right now, if it's a right-handed starter, there's no there's no left-hander off the bench at all. And if it's a left-handed starter, okay, fine. You have lefties to come in with if there's a righty reliever later, but even the, even then. It depends on who's sitting out. Are you sitting out Stott and Marsh? And then, okay, fine. Then you have guys. If not, the only guy sitting out is Clemens. Is Cody Clemens the guy you want putting up in a big spot late in the game? All right. So that's why I look at it and say I I, I don't think Josh Harrison's long for this team, but I've been wrong about that already because we've been saying that for about a month that he yeah. shouldn't he shouldn't be here. Yeah, it's surprising. It is. Um, before we get to one last thing, I we have to talk about Bryce Harper now. And yeah. you know, it was kind of funny. Like, he's he's one of the biggest names in baseball. The All Star Game is an exhibition, and I understand wanting to get high profile players into the game. I understand why the Phillies would certainly be pushing for Bryce Harper to to make the All Star team, and that's that's great uh, because casual fans you don't get to see him play every night. You want to see Bryce Harper play. There's no world in which Bryce Harper deserved to be an all-star this season. And it almost kind of felt a little bit unnatural watching the Phillies make such a strong push to get him in as a designated hitter. And all the credit in the world goes to him for getting back early. And we've, we've noted this before that, hey, listen, he wasn't even supposed to be back yet. And, and the fact that he's contributed, he had a big two-run single last night. I'm not here to, to dump on Bryce Harper. I mean, let's let's be real. But at the same time, you have to kind of look at what's going on with him and – you look at the season stats, you go, okay, cool, whatever. He's hitting 278, on base percentage 380. That's really strong. 763 OPS, it's down. Like he's that OPS has sunk here recently. And you look at what he's done the last 15 games. And, you know, he's hitting 259. He's only slugging 276. Last seven games, he's hitting 125. Like he's really struggled. And it seems like you would think the longer and further he gets removed from, from this injury and coming back from it, the more he would be sort of gaining his traction. And instead, it's kind of gone the opposite direction. He came back. He was so good right away that you just said, this guy is unbelievable. This is superhuman. And and lately, he's not been superhuman. He's, he struggled. And I guess it I just – I think it really it's an acknowledgement of that. But more than anything – what do you expect out of Bryce Harper the rest of the way? Like in the second half, do we get something that looks more like the Bryce Harper we've become accustomed to, or are we kind of just playing with 65% Bryce Harper for the remainder of the year? So here's, I'm going to give you, I think a slightly different answer. You know what I expect out of Bryce Harper? I expect Bryce Harper to figure out why he can't hit a breaking ball all of a sudden, or why he can't recognize mm -hmm. a breaking ball all of a sudden. That's what I expect out of Bryce Harper. He's one of the best players in the game. It's not like he hasn't been thrown breaking stuff before. He's just seeing more of it. And the reason he's seeing more of it is because teams realize he's killing us on fastballs. So we're just not going to throw him fastballs. Right. I'm sure he's had that at times in his career before. He needs to adjust to that, plain and simple. And that's to me, that's on the player. That's on Bryce Harper. He needs to be better at that. I give him a lot of credit for even though he he's still struggling and has been in a lot of ways for a lot longer than I think even you, the numbers you've pointed out. But the reason that you don't see it is because he does still find a way to get on base. He does still find a way to get that odd single or walk a couple times in a game and and he's still finding his way. But the but the there is a complete lack of 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 consistency and then there's with the exception of the hit yesterday that drove in the winning runs uh in that game even though it was early um there's been a lack of clutch from yeah. bryce harper he's, he's and, 10 for 50 with runners in scoring position he's in 200 with runners in scoring position this yeah 
Yeah. I mean, and, and so he's got, you know, only 13 extra base hits this year. That's it. Yeah. That's it, right? So and and you and it's funny because if you watch him swing, he hits balls hard. It's not like you're sitting there saying, "Oh, well, you know, he's still maybe not physically right and you know, the swing's just not there. He doesn't have the power anymore." I, I don't buy it. Like I when I you watch him make contact and you hear it. Like if you're there at the at the ballpark, the ball coming off of Bryce Harper's bat sounds different than a lot of other people because of how how powerful his swing is, how much force he puts behind it. There's so much torque in his swing that that ball, every time he hits it off that barrel, is makes a, a, a whomping sound that's different than everybody else. He's still doing that. He's had he's run into a little bit of bad luck. I'll I'll give him I'll give him that because he has hit some balls hard and right at guys or guys have made nice catches where he had that one game where the wind was so bad like he hit three balls of the warning track. I think all of them could have been home runs, right? So there there were there there has been a little bit of bad luck, but it's more about pitch recognition at this point and and being able to identify when he's now being how he's now being pitched because he's he's expecting fastballs and fastball counts and not getting them and swinging through pitches and that's putting him in in bad counts and that's why he's maybe striking out a little bit more or making weaker contact on certain on certain pitches he needs to figure it out i do not think that this is physical with him i really don't i really don't well i mean i I think that that's probably encouraging then you look at what he's done against left-handed pitching specifically hit 256 against lefties last year ops was in the high 700s this year it's 485 sitting 185 against lefties Uh, you you kind of just get the sense that it's going to come and that's why i have not talked a lot about bryce harper on the show because it's almost just hey look the the numbers have been okay he's he's been productive at at times for them he's not the player that we you know typically expect but you just kind of get the sense it's it's coming, but at the same time, you do look up and you say he did not homer in the month of June, and or or he has not yet to date. Maybe he does before we close things out this weekend. But uh, it's just I am now at the point where I'm like, okay, I think you at least have to acknowledge that this is ongoing. Yeah, well, it absolutely is, and you know we keep saying, Bob, whenever whenever they lose a game, more often than not these days. <laughs> We're saying it's because of failings of the offense, right? And it and that that has to be on the players. Well, right. He's one of the players and that it that it falls on. We're starting to see Turner come around a little bit. Like uh, you're starting to see a little bit more of the Trey Turner we expect. Still not there, but I think it's it's been slowly coming for Turner, and that's a good sign. Schwarber's been typical Schwarber, right? Um, and we've talked about Castellanos being their all-star and Stott being really consistent. And now Marsh, he was struggling, but now it's kind of turned it around. But the guys that aren't doing what they're supposed to do are Real Muto, Harper, Boom. Yeah. They're the three. Yeah. And they're they're the three that you need to see more out of going forward. I'm with you on that. Um, I got a wrap here, so uh, yeah. we can do one last thing. We're going to need to do it under 120 seconds, though. Well, we'll, we'll do it fast. In baseball, there's always you know these things that happen rarely that you that you find are really cool, right? Guy hits for the cycle doesn't happen that often. Awesome when it happens. Real Muto's that was even though they lost that game, pretty cool. Um, you know, guy hits three homers in a game. Oh, that's really cool. Bob, I got to tell you, I've never been more dispirited watching a perfect game in my life than watching Domingo Herman throw a perfect game against the Oakland A's part of me was saying this sucks because the Oakland A's suck. Part of me say, was saying this sucks because it's the Yankees. And part of me was saying this sucks because this guy was suspended for cheating earlier this, like a month ago. And now he comes out and throws a perfect game. I, I, I don't know. How do you feel? About, like I've never been so disappointed with an accomplishment. I didn't want to see him do it. I found myself sitting there openly rooting for Oakland to break it up because I didn't want to see it happen. Yeah. I was watching, uh, in, in, uh, real time and I, I went to sleep in the eighth inning. Uh, I I honestly, I mean, so to to kind of echo your sentiment, I was just like, okay, if he does it, I, I I appreciate history and we haven't seen it done in what is been 12, 2012 Felix Hernandez. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's something that it's, 
you get one of these and you, you got, where were you when he did that? And that is not what I found myself feeling or asking myself the next morning. I just said, I don't care because you're right. You cheated. Uh, the Yankees thing, you know, listen, okay. Like I, I hear you on that, but yeah. the, the, the biggest thing for me, and also there are some, some off the field issues with Domingo Herman that uh, I, yes. I think are probably worth recognizing as well. So you package that all together and um, it's an incredible thing and it's a hell of an accomplishment. And I just simply said, eh, I don't care. And if uh, it happens again in 10 years, uh, I'll be really excited the next time it happens, but that was maybe the the least up for a moment like that I've ever been. So I'm I, right I, there with you. I agree, hundred percent. That's that was it. I was, I was just kind of like, I know last week's was fun. This week I had to go back the other yeah. the other way, man. Yeah. It was just it killed me. It killed me to yeah. sit there watching that happen. I, I think a lot of people felt like that. I, I don't think that was a, a really celebrated moment uh, nationally. It didn't have that same type of same type of pop that you'd otherwise expect. And I do think. In addition to the fact that it, it was Domingo Herman and there were some issues with him, uh, the fact that it was against the Oakland A's, I think, also does take a little bit of the, the shine off of it. And the fact that there were probably, what, 2,800 people there? So yeah, yeah. They've been getting better crowds since yeah, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah, they, they've, but on the con, and this will be the last thing I'll say on it, uh, on the converse, just imagine. If that was Shohei Otani that threw that perfect game, well, I mean, you never baseball would still be promoting it today. Yeah, you would never hear the end of it. It would be, I mean, Shohei Otani, it's a fly out to the warning track and it's like, uh, it gets tweeted across every social media account in baseball. So, and as it should, I get it. I'm not hating on Shohei Otani. No, it's just, right. that's hating on baseball more than anything yeah, else. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for tuning in. Uh, for Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm Bob Wankel. Thanks for listening to Crossed Up. Make sure that you're following us wherever you get your podcast. Watch us on YouTube. Do us a favor. Also, jump in, give us a rating, leave a comment, do all of those things. Show is growing slowly. Uh, but steadily, uh, and we want to keep that progress moving, and you can help us do that. Uh, thank you for tuning in, and we will talk to you on Monday.